This is the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast. This is VP. We are a solutions-based podcast, diving into the world of contrarian investing and alternative finance. We are hosted on the No Nonsense Forex YouTube channel, nonsenseforex.com, and podcast players everywhere. Well, my voice is about 85% back, and I really think this is going to be a big episode in the grand scheme of things, so let's go ahead and jump into it now. Uh, the fir very first thing I want to say is I know there is a lot of enthusiasm by listeners outside of the United States in terms of gaining access to North American ETFs. And this has been very, very hard to do. I was first made aware of this when I put out the Uranium video on the No Nonsense Forex YouTube channel. At the time, there was a lot of enthusiasm about Uranium ETFs, especially from people outside of the United States. Problem was, they had no way of investing in them. And then about two weeks later, they took off. Heartbreaking. So let me go ahead and say to you now, in terms of ETFs, you know, especially North American ETFs, in the future, there is hope on the horizon. Long-term and short-term. Uh, Long-term in the ways of tokenized finance, which I think is going to take over the entire ecosystem. We will have an episode on that in the future. Um, but that could be a little while. But that's going to allow everybody to invest in everything, uh, which is very exciting. But there could be a short-term solution as well, and give me a few weeks to get it all hammered out. I cannot make any guarantees. It's not going to be the perfect solution, um, but it could give many of you around the world access to some of these instruments that you did not have access to before. So when I have episodes like this, and I have future episodes about ETFs, pay attention, take notes, do the research, because I think your time is coming. I just don't know exactly how soon, but it could be soon. Now, we're sitting here talking about ETFs. Why is this contrarian? Well, it's not. This is simply a vehicle we are going to use to help accomplish our overall contrarian investing goals. They make ETFs for normie finance. They make ETFs for us, too. And I like them a lot. And I'll talk about why in just a moment. But this is going to be an overall crash course. I'm going to condense it into this 10 Minutes Plus podcast. Because there are some moving parts here, and you need to understand how these vehicles work. Just like anything else, you need to understand how your investment platform works. If you're a bond investor, you need to know how bonds work. There's just simply no excuse for fumbling over the actual vehicle that you are choosing to use. So let me take this time not only to state my case in terms of how these fit into our overall investment strategy, but to go over some of the basic things you need to know. So at any point in time, if you're ever confused, you can simply just come back to this podcast episode and listen to it again. Because like them or not, and most people love them, <laughs> ETFs, the popularity has gone through the roof. You know, if you think you are smarter than all the hedge funds and pension funds and sovereign wealth funds that have been flooding into these things in the last five years, you go right ahead. Uh, but I currently use them, and I plan on using them a lot more in the future. And the main reason is this. If you don't know, an ETF is more or less a basket of stocks that all have something in common. So for us contrarian investors, it might be a basket of gold mining stocks. might be just an overall broad-scale commodities basket. It could be a basket of blockchain companies. And even though they do charge a fee, which we will get into, the greatest thing about them is you have to understand, the sectors we are going after... Even though we have a symmetry on our side, that does not mean these sectors are without risk. In fact, these sectors are far more volatile than other sectors are, pound for pound. So when I am putting together my investment portfolio for whatever sector I am interested in, ETFs are going to play a large part because these sectors alone already have insane beta, insane upside just in the sector themselves. So if I decide to go on the more defensive side of that spectrum via an ETF, I might be giving up a little bit of the upside, but I'm really doing wonders for my downside risk. And as you guys know, that's very, very important to me. And again, the sector already has so much upside that if all I do is play it more defensively within these sectors and the sector takes off, I'm still making a lot of money. Now, if you want to add a couple of very high upside, high volatility plays in your overall portfolio, that's fine. You're allowed to do that. But to be able to get rid of a lot of my downside risk, because again, I no longer have to pick the stock. I just have to get the sector right and have those ETFs serve as an undercurrent to the rest of my investments within that sector. I'm going to do it all day. 
I would go so far as to say if you're interested in a particular sector, let's say something like copper, that the very first move you make is to go into an ETF so you can get that exposure and then from there do further research into individual stocks. Now, if you were to do this in reverse and your very first move was to go out and find a highly speculative copper exploration stock with a half million dollar market cap, I can sit here with confidence and say that you're doing it wrong. You're playing the lottery. And this podcast is not for lottery players. This podcast is for people who understand where we are in the cycle, understand the very high upside opportunities which are available to us right now, and despite that upside, still want to take as intelligent of an approach as humanly possible to make sure that when the run does come, we are absolutely participating in it and gaining from it. And taking more defensive positions in these sectors is absolutely essential in achieving those goals. And ETFs allow us to do that. So without further ado, let's get into some of the basics that you need to know and be aware of. First off, uh, these are not free. They do have something called an expense ratio. Some people flip out over these expense ratios. Some people don't care. I'm really in the latter. Um, I understand that the upside I'm shooting for is high enough to where, at the end of the day, the expense ratio isn't really going to matter that much. But if you're stuck between two different choices, and one of them has a decidedly higher expense ratio than the other one does, well, then that might really factor into your decision. And I wouldn't blame you for that. So an expense ratio is a percentage of your overall investment that goes straight to the issuer. Think of it as a fee for the privilege of investing in their ETF. You know, they got to keep the lights on too. They got to pay people. I get it. Um, but some expense ratios are larger than others. And remember too, you will be paying this expense ratio every year you hang on to the ETF. So as buy and hold investors, this is also something to watch. Now, expense ratios are referred to in something called basis points. One basis point is one one hundredth of a percentage. So let's just take the SPY. SPY is the S&P 500 ETF, the main one. And it is known for having a very low expense ratio. So it currently sits at an expense ratio of nine basis points. So what percentage is that? That's going to be 0.09%. So if you were to invest $1,000 into SPY, you would pay the issuer 90 cents. 90 cents. Now, if you were to invest in GDX, which is the, big, the biggest uh, gold mining ETF out there, now that expense ratio is going to be higher. You pay for creativity and you pay for agility. Just think of it like that. And their expense ratio is 52 basis points. So 0.52%, meaning if you were to invest $1,000 into the GDX, you'd be paying the issuer $5.20. Again, quite manageable. Think about it. Not even 10 years ago, we all had to pay at least anywhere from $7 to $20 per trade online. And no matter what it was. So these expense ratios have really never deterred me one way or the other. But understand too, the expense ratio is not all you are going to pay. There is something called total cost of ownership. Uh, I'm not going to explain it all right here. I will leave a really good article down below in the show notes if you want to know more. But rest assured, it is not going to cut that much into your overall investment. Uh, but you should certainly know what it is. So check out that article down below. As we move into the next topic, and that is the topic of liquidity. All you crypto investors are pretty familiar with this as well. You generally want something with high liquidity. Um, you might not get as much upside as getting it into an ETF at the very you know, early stages. It's like anything else. Um, but high liquidity has its benefits. First of all, if you're looking to invest in an ETF with low liquidity, or really a stock for that matter, especially in the type of stocks we go after that aren't being watched and invested by a whole lot of people, you're going to have a real chance to see a very wide bid and ask spread when it finally comes time to buy. This is not something you really want, because the wider that spread is, the more you are likely going to have to pay. The further away the price that you get the chance to buy it at is going to be from the actual price. And when you do the math, what does that cost? You have to factor these things in. And then the major trap that people who invest in low liquidity stocks and ETFs can find themselves in is when it comes time to sell. This is not Forex. This is not crypto. You don't just sit there and get all of your orders filled 100% of the time automatically whenever you want them. 
in stocks, there has to be somebody else wanting to buy your stock or your ETF. And let's say prices dropped a whole lot and you want to liquidate. Well, if there weren't a whole lot of people interested in that ETF to begin with, and this is indicated by a low market cap, when it comes time for you to sell, who's to say anybody's going to even be there? You may not be able to sell. You might end up in one of those roach motel type situations where it's really easy to check in, but checking out, different story. So again, buying ETFs with low liquidity and low market caps sure does seem like a lot of fun at first, but go ahead and file this under that same column of taking unnecessary risk in an already volatile environment. I know there are those of us out there that take great pleasure in going after the obscure, but this is not the time to do that. Now, let's cover rebalancing. Rebalancing is what it sounds like. Um, the issuer at any point in time can take the components held within the ETF that you bought and completely change them around, either a little bit or a lot, either the percentages of those components within the ETF, or they can take certain stocks out and replace them with other stocks altogether. And this is where a little bit of research is going to have to be involved. You're going to have to talk to the issuer, or you're going to have to seek out sites and databases out there to where you can determine just how often this happens and how it usually goes down. Because sometimes if they rebalance and they take a profit on a particular stock, which they're totally allowed to do, guess who's going to pay taxes on that? Now, it's not going to be an extraordinary amount of taxes by any stretch, but these are some of the types of things you are going to need to expect when investing in ETFs, especially long-term buy and hold, which is what we do here. You know, if you're using them to trade, you know, rebalancing doesn't really factor in a whole lot. You know, but if you're going to sit on these, you know, until we finally get our day in the sun, then, you know, things like rebalancing absolutely does matter. And the good news is you're not going to have to spend hours of research on this. It's pretty easy to do. But again, you need to know what you're buying before you buy it. Now, the final thing I want to cover is what happens if you have an ETF and the ETF shuts down? Um, this does happen. And it's really kind of a big nothing burger at the end of the day, but you need to understand how this process goes down. Now, there's a lot of reasons why an ETF might close. It might not be getting the, the performance that it wants. It might not be getting the inflows that it wants. Or they might have designs on merging it into a different ETF. Now, the good news is, is the issuer will let you know about this and give you ample opportunity to either sell off your shares or to hold on to it. And if you hold on to it, they might just liquidate your shares right there, which, which is also fine. It's the same as selling. It's just at whatever price it is at the time. Uh, or you might become part of this merger, you know, if that's the route they're taking. Um, but ETFs do close. Uh, you will always get your money back. Uh, it can just be sometimes a matter of how soon and at what price. And you will have a good amount of say on that. Um, so like a lot of these things, they don't factor in huge in the grand scheme of things because we are looking for a lot of upside from these things. So any little ancillary fees here or there, or, you know, steps we got to take, you know, we're generally okay with that. I just wanted to have an episode and an early episode that ensures that you will not make a lot of these silly mistakes that a lot of people make, myself included, when you first get started in these things. But ETFs do play a large part in my overall mission, and therefore they will also be playing a large role in this podcast as well. So I want to make sure we hit the ground running. So if you are interested in ETFs and you are not invested in them yet, please understand and be aware of things like expense ratios, liquidity, rebalancing, and what to do if your ETF closes down. If you can do those simple things, you are miles ahead of most people. I'd like to thank you for downloading and listening to this podcast. And I will not be saying the tagline I always say at the end of these podcasts because it just doesn't apply. Uh, but the base lesson podcast episodes, as far as I can tell, are officially over. Thank you for trudging through them, and I hope you understand the importance. We simply could not move on without them. Uh, but move on, we're about to do. It's about to get real sexy in here. So do whatever you need to do, prep however you need to prep, and I will see you next week.